Hello, everybody. Good evening to you. And depending on where you are, what you are in the world, it might be good morning or good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out on a Friday evening. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Sri Ranjini join us tonight. She has a 15-year uh, career in Ayurvedic clinical practice, transdisciplinary research as well as, as and academics. Currently, she is a freelance research consultant at Ramaya Ayurveda in Bangalore. And for the last 18 months, she has been giving Ayurvedic consultations across Canada as well. Dr. Sri Ranjini balances her work together with family life, as well as sitting on the board of one of the world's most accessed publications, PubMed. She'll be talking to us this evening on Ayurveda, can manage the side effects of cancer, giving it to us from the perspective of science. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sri Ranjini. Very warm good evening to all of you out there in Singapore. And yeah, depending on which time zone you're in, uh, good morning or um, good afternoon. So today um, I will be uh, sharing a couple of um, uh, information uh, regarding how we manage side effects of cancer um, using Ayurveda treatments. Uh, some of these are from my clinical experience of having uh, seen a few patients of cancer and having managed not the disease, but the side effects of the therapies that they have often received. And some of them um, I will be showing you for uh, the current research, clinical research evidence that uh, currently exists. Uh, of course, um, there is very much limited information when it comes to uh, published research evidence, uh, but there is a lot of anecdotal uh, instances of Ayurveda um, helping very effectively in the management of side effects of cancer and cancer therapy. So um, it's, been, it's not surprising that um, anywhere uh, ranging from 30 to 70 percent of cancer patients across the world use complementary and alternative medicines. Uh, varied kinds of therapies are, US, uh, are used, uh, Ayurveda being one of the most favored ones, herbal medicine and Ayurveda. Now, US, uh, Canada, Australia, Europe, Singapore, you see the statistics from any of these countries and you see that a huge population does use alternative therapies along with their main, mainstream healthcare um, option for the management of cancer and cancer-related symptoms. Now, uh, earlier in the 1970s, this was roughly around 25%, uh, and then it rose to more than 32% in 1990s, and after 2000, 50%. And now in 2020, we're seeing close to 60 to 70% of people wanting to use uh, complementary and alternative medicines along with their um, mainstream medical care for cancer. And why do pa patients come for uh, cancer care to CAM? Uh, the first main reason would be to look for options to cure cancer itself, to halt the disease progression, to prevent relapse. But most often patients come to alleviate the side effects of cancer therapy to enhance their immunity and strength so that they're better able to receive the cancer therapy, as well as they're better able to uh, manage and get back to their regular lifestyle uh, along with the therapies. And there's a huge expectation from family because they feel that somehow uh, the mainstream healthcare is currently not able to effectively deliver a comprehensive strategy for managing cancer and cancer side effects. And hence, there is always an onus on the patient to seek this kind of alternative therapies for all these uh, different conditions during cancer. Now, how can Ayurveda help? Uh, does Ayurveda help? Where does it help? Yes, um, Ayurveda gives a very comprehensive understanding of the human uh, body. So we talk about it more as a functional entity than as the structures that are involved. And this functional dysbiosis, which occurs in cancers and in all other diseases, can be very effectively treated with Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is most often used with conventional treatment to give a synergistic effect. That is, whatever is the cancer therapy that is being uh, taken along with that to boost the effect as synergistic effect, Ayurveda is given 
uh, for cancer, uh, not just for cancer, but also for cancer side effects. Uh, to reduce the morbidity and mortality of the conventional treatment, yes, uh, mortality and morbidity is one of the common side effects of uh, cancer and cancer care. So uh, by taking Ayurveda, the quality of life improves, the lifespan improves. So this is one of the areas where cancer care can do better with uh, add-on of Ayurveda. And in advanced stages of cancer, where not much can be done in conventional treatment for palliative care, we do use Ayurveda. So palliative care helps to uh, keep a better quality of life for the patient in his end stage. And yes, for primary and secondary prevention. So we have seen that most uh, diseases arise from a lot of inflammation within the system, a lot of toxicity within the system. So for primary prevention of cancers, as well as secondary prevention of relapse of cancers, this Ayurveda can come in as a very effective tool. So uh, how is it that Ayurveda uh, differs um, uh, when it comes to cancer care? Uh, we don't just look at what is the one side effect that we are, we are uh, taking care of. It's not that suppose the patient has uh, radiation-induced mucositis. It is not just the mucositis that we treat. But when we treat the mucositis, we look at the dosha, we look at the dhatu, we look at the mala, the agni, that is your metabolism, your bio waste, your tissue elements, your functional entities, vata, pitta, and kapha, as well as your sensory motor faculties, the indriya, the manas, the psychological component, as well as the spiritual domain. So all these get catered to by a comprehensive healthcare. It is not just one side effect that Ayurveda tries to treat. While the, that side effect does get effectively treated, along with it, a whole lot of other uh, bio entities within the system, which would have gone haywire because of the disease, as well as a, because of the therapy, the intense therapy that is given, can be taken care of more holistically with the help of Ayurveda. Um, so let us just look at a um, little bit of introduction of how Ayurveda looks at the human body, which some of you might be knowing. But um, I will talk about this with respect to cancer um, side effects that are seen and how we understand the dosha in the cancer side effects. So we know that vata, pitta, and kapha are the three bio entities which are, uh, which are um, basically balancing the body. They are present in various proportions in different human beings and they are never the same. They are changing with the circadian rhythm, they are changing with the seasonal rhythm, but with all this, with all the exogenous and the endogenous changes that they undergo, they help to maintain the human body in a balance, in a perfect balance, right? Now, when there is uh, cancer or uh, because of the cancer therapy that uh, the patients do undergo, there are a lot, there's a lot of disbalance or imbalance in these doshas. So vata, pitta and kapha go out of balance because of which we see a lot of the effects coming. So if we are to look at some of, uh, uh, just look at some of the side effects, for example, when there is too much of pitta within the system because of the cancer therapies. So the cancer therapies have a lot of ushna guna in them. Ushna will be too much of heat in them, right? Because they are very uh, high dose and uh, highly toxic treatments which are given to kill the cancerous cells. So by nature of that, they have a lot of pitta component in them. Now, this pitta component, uh, based on what it does within the body, it causes a lot of inflammation. So when we treat pitta, when we treat, uh, use Ayurveda to treat the pitta to come down, uh, inflammation comes down. So a lot of cancer side effects like nausea, vomiting, and all these do come down because we are trying to balance the pitta. Same thing with kapha. With cancer uh, therapies, what happens is there's a lot of dryness which is created within the body. There is so with the Ayurveda treatments that we give, we try to balance out the vata so that the patient has better recovery, better um, strength, better energy. We also try to keep the kapha in balance, which causes a lot of um, uh, other issues within the system. So basically, cancer side effects do come when vata, pitta, and kapha are imbalanced in improportionate ways. And that is what Ayurveda treats. And that is how Ayurveda tries to bring back the balance within the system. Now, these are the different tissue elements. We will not focus a lot on this slide. But these are the different tissue elements that are affected not just by the cancer, but also by the cancer therapy. 
So we see that patients complain of inflammation, patients have a lot of uh, issues with their internal mucosal lining, with the skin, with the oral cavity and so on. So all these tissue elements being affected, we try to ensure that proper healing occurs in these tissues and this healing will help the, the patient to lead a better quality of life. Now, the main thing that um, Ayurveda tries to treat in cancer and cancer side effects is what we call as ama or the toxic waste that is generated in the human body. Now, this toxic waste is generated in the human body in a lot of other diseases too, not just cancer. Different types and different tissue level ama or different cellular level ama is generated. And this ama that is generated or this toxin that is generated needs to be constantly treated with the herbs that we do use in Ayurveda. Now, without treating this toxin, without treating this endotoxin, which is constantly being released, any amount of treatment that we give from outside is not going to be beneficial to the system because as long as there is a biotoxin, there is a pro-inflammatory waste product within your system, unless and until it is flushed out, it continues to block the channels of circulation, it continues to cause the disease to progress, it continues to cause more and more side effects. So any treatment that we give with Ayurveda will ensure that A, the doshas, that is the vata, pitta, and kapha are well balanced. B, the structural elements, that is the dhatus, are well nourished, given proper nutrition so that they're, they are able to heal better. And C, look at ama, ensure that this toxin is continuously being flushed out from the system so that it does not add to the disease progression, add to the side effects. So these are three things that any and every Ayurveda um, treatment methodology does try to at, uh, attend to. Now, Ayurveda is not just taking a herb and feeling fine, right? You can't just take turmeric and then say that you're cured for uh, from all side effects of cancer. No, uh, every Ayurveda treatment regimen constitutes a multimodal approach. So you have more than one thing that is that has to become a part of your daily life, which will help you to take care of cancer, take care of cancer side effects. So the circadian rhythm, getting up at the right time in the morning, following all the right things during the day, sleeping at the right time, eating at the right time, simple things like this can make a huge benefit in helping how your body reacts to the cancer, reacts to the cancer therapy. So no matter uh, which disease state you are in, it is very essential that we ensure that the circadian rhythm is well maintained. The body is given the right things at the right time, exercise at the right time, eat at the right time, um, take your medications at the right time. So that helps a lot in uh, improving your response to cancer, right? The second thing is the seasonal changes, the exogenous changes or the changes in the environment that tend to affect your body. Now, peak summer, your body does get dehydrated a lot. So it becomes essential that you hydrate yourself well. When you hydrate yourself well, the cancer side effects do come out, do come down. So every season has its own seasonal uh, regimen or things that you need to follow during that season for better response from your internal milieu or the body's internal mechanism to the external changes in the environment. So even this is very much essential for maintaining a healthy lifestyle, but it is more essential when there is a disease, when we have a disease, when we have some kind of, um, of an imbalance within our system that we pay attention to the daily, the circadian rhythm, to the seasonal changes, and the next thing that we advocate in Ayurveda is the purificatory procedures or the panchakarma, as it's more commonly known as. So these help to reduce the ama, they help to bring back the imbalance of the doshas uh, back to normalcy. So there are different procedures which are a little exhaustive and which are used for all cancer care, cancer side effect care. So this is the third arm of the multimodal Ayurveda approach. The fourth arm being all the herbs, the minerals, and other medications that we use as part of rejuvenating the system, as part of disease cure, as part of disease management that we use. The next one is behavioral therapeutics or the way we 
conduct ourselves during um, cancer care, uh, during cancer side effect care. So it becomes very essential that we understand what are the limitations of our body. We understand what are the limitations that we need to address. We also understand how our psychological component, the sattva, the raja, the tama, the sattvic nature, the calm nature, needs to be imbibed into our daily activities. We need to reduce too much of rajasic, that is the too much of uh, irritant behavior and too much, of, too much of sluggishness or the tamasic behavior. So reduce your irritant behavior, reduce your sluggish behavior, focus on getting a more calm and composed psychological um, behavioral attitude. And that helps a long way in making your body better able to receive the cancer care, better able to fight out the side effects of cancer care. Some of the things that we do prescribe for this is um, yoga, um, pranayama yoga, which you will listen. Um, other speakers will probably speak more in detail about this. But these are some components which every at every stage of cancer care, at every stage of side effect care, we need to incorporate into our daily life. So it is not just popping a pill and trying to see that Ayurveda works. That is not how Ayurveda works. Ayurveda has much more to give than just popping a pill. So when we follow all this along with the herbs that we take, that is when we see a more comprehensive care. That is when our body responds better and we, we have lesser side effects of the disease. So this is a no compromise, as in I spent some more time on this because this is a no compromise. By following all this is only when we are able to better manage the side effects of cancer. Now, I will take you through uh, some of this. Um, like I explained, this, the daily regimen would be uh, following a neat circadian rhythm and so on. But I'll take you through a few of these things, some of the herbs that are commonly used and some of the dietary guidelines that we advise for all cancer patients. Um, and I'll give you explanations of how these are beneficial for the system and how they help to reduce the side effects of cancer. So when it comes to diet, what we generally prescribe is eat light food so uh, a patient who is having cancer side effects of nausea and vomiting because of the chemotherapy is unable to take a large quantity of food at once, right? So we recommend that you eat smaller portions of food. The food should be light. You cannot afford to have heavy food because the body already has a lot of endotoxins, has a lot of armor. So eat light food, eat hot food. So try to stick to cooked food, steamed food, hot food as much as possible. Try to avoid a lot of these uncooked foods, uncooked meat especially, because the body is not in a position to digest them well, is not able to metabolize them well. So stick to cooked food as much as possible. Make sure that the food is well lubricated, that is it has the right amount of oils, the right amount of fats. This is very essential because um, the body does undergo a lot of dryness following cancer therapies. The, like I said, the therapies are very intensive, are very toxic, toxic in nature, and hence they strip the body of all the nutrition. They make the body really, really dry. So make sure that you take a lot of good lubricated food. By lubrication, I mean that make sure that the food has the right amount of fats in it. Good fats, again, not the bad fats, right? Um, eat in the right quantity. Like I said, eat smaller quantities because... Um, you're not able to take one um, big portion of food at a time. Now, every meal that we take should be composed of all the nutritional elements, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the minerals and vitamins, or as we call in Ayurveda, it should be complete with shadrasa, the six tastes. You need to have a little bit of sweet, a little bit of sour, a little bit of salt, a little bit of bitter, astringent, and pungent taste. These are the six tastes that we talk about in Ayurveda. So make sure that we are taking the right kind of food, nutritious, which helps to nourish the dhatus, which helps the tissues, which helps to keep the doshas in balance. Now avoid opposing foods. What are opposing foods? So there's a whole category of foods that um, maybe in the question and answer session, if anyone has doubts regarding that, we can take up. But generally, we don't mix two foods of different qualities. We don't mix hot and cold. We don't mix uh, sour and sweet. We don't mix... Um, a lot of foods together because then it becomes inherently toxic to the body. It becomes very, very heavy for digestion and 
a simple example would be uh, milkshakes with uh, with sour fruits now milk is something which is um, mildly acidic in nature now when you are adding fruits which are highly acidic in nature into the milkshake and making a milkshake out of it that is when um, the body does not um, the body refuses it or the body does not like that kind of a toxin right so this is a very simple example for opposing foods um now eat at the right time eat at the right place so ensure that yes the uh, the disease the side effects of the disease will uh, make us really really weak but as much as possible let us try to sit in a place wherein it is uh, very pleasant um so that our food gets we eat well and we digest well uh, other things is eat mindfully and eat soulfully your your tongue may ask for a lot of different kinds of food but pay attention to whether it is right for your system or not and eat mindfully and eat soulfully uh, some of the things that um, we need to pay attention to would be the dosha compatibility so if you have too much of vata then you may want to avoid too much of spice pungent bitter and astringent taste if there's too much of pitta within the system you may want to avoid spice sour and salt and if there is too much of kapha within the system you may want to avoid sweet sour and salt so you need to kind of understand where your system is what your body is asking for and eat the right kind of food to ensure that diet is nutritious and does not affect the cancer does not affects does not increase the side effects of the cancer so when we take food which is very spicy sour and salt the nausea and vomiting does tend to increase so it is better to take more alkaline bitter astringent food which helps to balance out the too much of pitta within the system which is causing the nausea and vomiting and this is a general dietary guideline of course we can go into more specifics if we like now how does this ayurveda diet the six states that are there in the ayurveda diet help it reduces inflammation it is antioxidant because all the herbs and spices that we use all the uh, green leafy vegetables that we use um, they are antioxidant in nature they nurture the gut microbiota now there is a lot of dysbiosis that happens because of cancer and cancer care so the gut microbiota are completely out of out of sync and when we eat the right kind of food hot food light food nutritious food with the right amount of fats it helps to nurture the gut microbiota it gives a lot of phytochemicals that are protective against cancers and dietary polyphenols that help to kill the cancer cells themselves so this is how a comprehensive ayurveda diet will help to take care of cancer and cancer side effects now i'll just focus on very few common herbs that are used um, in cancer care and for which we do have some kind of clinical evidence there are a whole lot of herbs a whole lot of polyherbal compounds that have been studied for uh, cancer care in and cancer side effect care in cell uh, cellular models and uh, animal models but i am only going to focus on clinical research or research in patients in humans that uh, have been uh, done over the last two decades uh, sorry the uh, the last 20 years now um, ashwagandha or indian ginseng or withania uh, which many of you may be familiar with has helped to improve survival rates to reduce cancer related fatigue and improve the quality of life in a lot of breast cancer patients where it was given at the dose of 2 grams every 8 hours right during chemotherapy while the patients were on chemotherapy and even after that they did continue to take ashwagandha and it did reduce a lot of uh, side effects like fatigue uh patients were able to function better and they live for a longer time uh, their survival rates really really increased with ashwagandha uh the second herb that i would talk about would be ginger which many of us very commonly use in our diet uh but ginger root powder ginger extract did reduce nausea and vomiting um so they did a um, a myometric study wherein they looked at the muscle the movement within the gastrointestinal system and they saw that the gastric dysrhythmia which happens because of cancer chemotherapy which causes nausea and vomiting reduced significantly patients appetite improved so because they were eating better their nutrition was better they were feeling more energetic and that is why they had a better quality of life so ginger was something which has been extensively studied uh, for cancer side effects the other thing that is very commonly used is turmeric 
Now, turmeric has been studied not just for cancer therapy, but also for addressing the uh, chemotherapy and radiation-induced dermatitis, that is the changes in the skin, the changes in the oral mucosa. There's a lot of, uh, especially in head and neck cancer patients, there's a lot of oral mucositis that we see, that is there, is there are a lot of lesions in the mouth in the oral cavity, and that reduces significantly by just applying turmeric along with honey, just uh, mixed with water, applying a paste before radiation, during and after radiation therapy, when we apply turmeric, it really, really helps to reduce this dermatitis. Uh, Trifala, uh, the three herbs which are very commonly used, which is uh, amla, the Indian gooseberry, and uh, uh, the other two herbs, the vibhitaki and haritaki, hared and bahir. When these three herbs, you make it into a decoction and rinse the mouth cavity, use it as a mouth rinse, uh, helps for cancer-induced, uh, uh, radiation-induced uh, oral mucositis, and it also helped to reverse precancerous lesions in uh, a small group of patients um, in India. So uh, these are some of the most frequently used herbs, the other one being uh, Indian licorice, uh, which again, when applied, reduces as a, or as a mouthwash, helps to reduce oral mucositis. Honey um, also is very useful when applied with turmeric for oral mucositis. And it also helps to reduce the neutropenia. So neutropenia is a, is a reduction in the white blood, um, in, in cellular components of the blood, which is seen with cancer chemotherapy. And when you give honey, it helps to improve or it improves the neutropenia, reduces the neutropenia. So these are, uh, there are a whole lot of other herbs which have been seen for their activity in can managing cancer and side effects of cancer. Some of them are mentioned here. Uh, so this is just the tip of the iceberg that I have shown you. So what you've seen is just a very, uh, it's actually the tip of the tip of the iceberg. That's all that we have touched today. Uh, this is just to give an overview so that you do understand that Ayurveda works as an anti-inflammatory, anti-cancerous, antioxidant, immune enhancing, as a pain relief medication in palliative care, as an antacid. So these are the different ways in which Ayurveda herbs, herbal mineral formulations, and therapies. So the oral rinse or the mouth rinse is one of the aspects of daily regimen. So we, we advise patients to gargle their mouth or to uh, do this oil pulling and other therapies for the oral health, which helps to prevent uh, cancerous lesions, right? So this is how Ayurveda works comprehensively not just at cancer, but also at all the other things that are part and parcel of cancer and cancer side effects. And this is where, um, like I said, just the tip of the uh, uh, iceberg, we do use Ayurveda even for dealing with depression, anxiety, and a lot of other psychiatric side effects of cancer, uh, skin changes, hair changes, quality, quality, quality of life to improve them. So we need to integrate Ayurveda with conventional care for better uh, patient care. And um, the best thing that I would suggest is try not to um, um, do a Google search and take ashwagandha or take turmeric or take, take ginger um, without a prescription, right? Because uh, your, your conventional care practitioner needs to know what you're, what you're taking along with the cancer care, mainstream healthcare that you're taking and consult a qualified Ayurveda practitioner so that you will be able to maximize and get better relief for cancer and cancer side effects with Ayurveda treatment. So with this, I would um, like to end this talk. Thanks to um, the organizers of International Conference in um, Integrative Medicine for Cancer Care for giving me an opportunity uh, for presenting my experience at uh, this uh, international conference. Thank you all uh, to the audience for a patient hearing. And uh, when I would hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sri Ranjini, for the presentation. So I see that um, we've got Panella. Hi, Dr. Sri Ranjini. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for the lecture. So um, you mentioned something uh, that was interesting that I feel like a lot of people struggle with, which is the health of their gut. So there are so many different articles and so many different solutions on how to have a healthy gut. There's fasting, and then there's also many different types of fermented um, concoctions that you make at home, like kombucha, kefir, 
how do you know or how can one person know what is the best solution for them? Because a lot of, in Ayurveda, we all know that a lot of conditions start from the gut. Whenever the gut is not healthy, everything else just kind of goes haywire because your agni is affected and that affects all the other agnis around the body. So in your opinion, because it cannot be generalized, um, how does one identify or how do they treat or how do they even begin to start taking care of their gut, even before it leads all the way into cancer? It is a very, uh, like you said, it is something that needs to be done every day. It is not that you take, uh, you take a four-minute preparation today and then you're, you're, you're good for the rest of your life, right? So that's not how it works. So some of the simple things that um, do suggest that you might be having a dysbiosis would be something as simple as getting up in the morning, um, not being able to pass uh, the bubbles easily, right? Uh, another thing would be sluggishness throughout the day wherein you're not feeling energetic, you're, you're really, really fatigued for no reason. You've not done anything actually, but you're feeling so fatigued. Uh, another thing could be um, frequent cropping up of um, some skin conditions, your skin breaking out into acne, um, there, are, there are a whole lot of small things which do show up when there is dysbiosis or when your gut microbiota aren't right. So uh, this needs something which you will do on a daily basis, which will include the right kind of food. Now, it's not that just fermented preparations improve your gut, gut microbiota, right? Uh, it's also possible to improve your gut microbiota with non-fermented daily food preparations that we do use using a lot of veggies, using a lot of cooked uh, veggies, a lot of fruits do help the right kind of fruits, not eating only one category of fruits, one category of vegetables. Uh, eating all the food groups do also help to give you a good gut. Uh, the fermented preparations, yes, there are people who are intolerant to milk, intolerant to curd, intolerant to yogurt. So these are people who will benefit by using other kinds of fermented preparations like um, it could be uh, vinegar, which is uh, apple cider vinegar, uh, which is kombucha. So depending on the region that you are uh, you are coming from, uh, depending, um, my main suggestion would be stick to your roots. So if you are if you are an Indian, for example, if you are uh, uh, an Indian, I would say uh, stick to buttermilk, which is something which genetically your body is inherently capable of adapting to. So it gives you a lot of, uh, you wouldn't want to be taking kombucha because that's not something, <laughs> right? Yeah. Stick to your roots. If you are an Asian, a Chinese or a Japanese, uh, then you would do, you would benefit better with whatever is culturally, geographically, the, the diversity that comes from your region. I wouldn't want to give buttermilk to somebody from Italy who wouldn't even know what is buttermilk, right? Mm. So that's very important. We, in Ayurveda, we say, yes, your desha say, yo jantuhu, tajam, tajau, shadam, hitam. So whoever is born or whoever has his roots from whichever place, use what is available there and it does. It's not that buttermilk improves the gut better than kombucha. No, it's not like that. It is what your body is genetically, hereditarily acceptably accepting and that works best for you. Thank you so much. I have a follow-up question. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just really excited to talk to her. So my follow-up question is, a lot of us, because we have so much abundance of food these days, right? And now we are working from home and it's COVID and we order stuff in. So one of the things I realize or, or one of the things that a lot of people tend to struggle with is hunger. They can never really figure out what when they're really hungry or when they're just feeling peckish because one of the things that also affects the gut health is when you overeat or when you go long periods of time of not eating and then after that long period of time you have a lot of food and then you get acidity and then your gut kind of tends to malfunction or goes into a state of imbalance so in Ayurveda they always say eat when you're hungry drink when you're thirsty so in this day and age when we have so much abundance of food and different types of fluids to drink, what is the one advice you would give anybody on, you know, how to recognize proper hunger and not just being peckish or being snackish? <laughs> that's, a, that's a loaded question. Uh, but, but yes, um, so see, typically you don't eat before three hours. And 
typically the, the rule of the thumb, right? You don't eat before three hours. You don't fast for more than six hours. That's the rule ah. of the thumb during the day, right? Now at night, uh, you, you, you have an early dinner, say by 6.37, three hours before bedtime is when you finish your dinner. And then you fast the next morning, you have a good 16 hour gap and you do your intermittent fasting, that really works. It, it makes your gut really, really healthy. Now, that does not mean that in the eight hours that you get, you eat every hour. No, that's not how okay. it's. <laughs> so you, uh, that, that's what people do. They, they do intermittent fasting. They fast for 16 hours. And in the eight hours that they get, they load the body so much that it needs more than 16 hours to burn whatever they eat in. So mm. that's not how. So on, on a regular basis, if you are otherwise healthy, if you are uh, exercising the right amount um, every day, you don't fast for more than six hours. You don't eat for, you don't eat before three hours. That's the rule of the thumb, right? Now, depending on that, depending on your sleep rate cycle, depending depending on your schedule, you can. Order. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much. Really, I appreciate it. Nice talking to you, Vanilla. Thank Likewise. you, Vanilla. Thank you. I'm gonna take one question from the chat. Uh, it's by Paritosh, but. Doctor, what is your experience with fresh case of cancer and its cure with Ayurveda alone? And I'm going to add on also to ask if you could also give us a spectrum of if it was stage one versus stage four, whether there are differences in body responses and, and its impact, Ayurveda's impact. Yeah, so to be honest, I have not treated cancer with only Ayurveda so far in my practice. It's not been the case because uh, for, for various reasons, uh, most of the patients do come to us after their uh, diagnosis of cancer, after having undergone cancer therapy. So then they come and seek alternative care. It's never been the case that I have treated someone with only Ayurveda uh, for cancer care specifically, right? So um, I wouldn't be able to answer you on that, but I, I am sure there are other um, doctors uh, who are speaking after me uh, who have experience in this particular area of having treated early stage cancer with only Ayurveda treatment. So I would, um, I would beg to be excused from answering this particular question because I do not have personal experience. But yes, uh, I do have experience in treating um, early stage cancer with uh, who have undergone conventional treatment, which could be uh, in the form of surgical procedures or with uh, chemo and radiotherapy and then uh, taking Ayurveda. And then we have seen that there, we have been able to halt the progression of the disease. Uh, patients have been in uh, remission for uh, quite a few number of years. And yes, there is a difference in how patients respond to uh, cancers in stage one, two, three, and four. As the disease progresses, it becomes more and more difficult, not just for conventional medicine, but also for Ayurveda. So in Ayurveda also, we do talk about our, our limitations. We have something called a sadhya, a sadhya of the disease. Like a disease is curable, a disease is manageable. There are categories of diseases which are just manageable. They are not curable. So yes, as the disease progresses, it goes to a stage of just being able to manage it and not being able to cure it. Um, so there is a response. The earlier you come, the better it is. Thank you, Dr. Sri Ranjini. Now, taking, continuing on the group chat, there's another question from Shilpil, Shilpli Atri. Hello, doctor. Some people have a family history of cancer. From an Ayurvedic point of view, what can we suggest to prevent the cancer? And if they take preventive measures, what are the chances that they won't get cancer? Lastly, is there scientific and empirical evidence on this? Yes. <clears throat> so there is uh, scientific evidence to say that the panchakarma therapies that we give, the biopurificatory therapies that we give, so there are different kinds of these biopurificatory therapies. There are uh, therapies which, wherein we induce uh, purgation, therapies wherein we give medicated enemas, and so on. So these therapies have been known to prevent, um, pre prevent cancer. So how is it proven? It is based on the different um, cellular and molecular changes that happen within the system. So you have a lot of inflammation, which is inherently there within the system. When these inflammatory markers come down, that means you have a better, um, better protection against uh, getting cancer. 
So by following a good circadian rhythm, by following the seasonal changes, uh, by listening to the seasonal changes and tuning your body to, uh, to uh, handle it better, by using biopurificatory therapies uh, regularly. So um, it could be something as simple as going on um, a fast, an intermittent fast every now and then, uh, caloric restriction. So reduce the number of calories that you take, which, he which helps to, which is anti-aging. It helps to delay aging. Now, cancer is one of the things that does come with age also. It's not just uh, uh, otherwise coming, right? So, so doing uh, caloric restriction uh, frequently so that you are, but doing it in a proper guided manner, not just doing it randomly every now and then. Uh, all these things and following a healthy lifestyle generally, keeping your stress levels low, now, stress is never going to go away from your life, right? So you need to be able to modulate your body to better respond to the stress, not react to the stress. So doing this kind of uh, regular activities does help you to protect yourself and prevent from getting cancer. Thank you. Akash is asking, my mom was treated for breast cancer. One and a half years has passed since a chemo. In addition to this, do you see stubborn cases? where there are side effects that keep on prolonging despite Ayurvedic and integrative therapies? Um, most often, if the patient has responded to the cancer therapy, the side effects are well managed. Uh, it's very, very rare that we do come with cases of uh, non-responsiveness to the side effects especially. Uh -huh. uh, respond really, really well in a few weeks to few months time, the patient is completely, if the cancer has been well arrested, the side effects are easily manageable. Uh, I would differ from giving personal prescriptions, but I would recommend that uh, Mr. Rakash does contact uh, an Ayurveda practitioner near your, uh, wherever you are located, uh, so that you can get a better guidance, one-to-one uh, -one examination and the guidance on how to go about in managing uh, the side effect that he did mention. Thank you for that. Just another question, and this is from me. When you begin, when a patient begins Ayurvedic and or integrative medicine yoga therapy, how long does it take before effects or before responses are seen? And, and, and does that vary person to person or stage to stage? Uh, it does vary person to person. It does vary stage to stage. It does vary depending on which cancer it is, right? Where the cancer has affected. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of uh, differences in how patient responses are seen, but it can be as early as few days, three, four days after starting the, starting the alternative treatments that they do well on different fronts, simple things like nausea vomiting comes down within 24 to 48 hours of starting the Ayurveda medication. So it's as quick as that, uh, but sometimes it does for, for the more, um, even the oral mucositis, right? Uh, the, the oral ulcers that you see, uh, they heal within, they start to heal within 24 to 48 hours. The patients are able to eat better. So it can be as quick as that, uh, but it does take time. It does take time, many, uh, a few weeks, uh, sometimes for them to get a grasp of how Ayurveda is helping them. Uh, and sometimes when the disease is really, really um, in its peak, uh, whatever we do, uh, the patient does not get relief because there's a whole lot of things going on within the body. So at that time, yes, uh, we do hit a, a, a wall many a time, but most times, the, the, the changes that we see happen within a few days itself. Thank you. We have one question from Chris Lee asking, Hi, Dr. Sri Ranjini, if a patient has an elevated specific dosha, example, kapha, how would you still incorporate the six taste Ayurveda diet? Would you eliminate the sweet part? Yeah, so generally what we do is we try not to eliminate any taste we try to reduce that particular taste and increase the opposing taste so that this kind of does, uh, does not affect the system. So if you have kapha, more, more of kapha, then you would use pungent, bitter, and astringent more than you would use uh, <clears throat> sweet, sour, and salt. But you wouldn't negate or you wouldn't completely stop this. Uh, so it could be, it's a very simple thing. So every food that you take has 
two, three, or four of these states in them already. So it becomes very difficult. Now, if you eat a grain of rice, right? Uh, uh, rice has sweet. Rice uh, has a little bit of bitter and astringent also. So you can't completely um, uh, shut down a particular taste. That doesn't happen. But you do take something which has more of the opposing tastes to help reduce the uh, imbalance of the dosha. That's a question from Serena Sim. What type of cancers, in your experience, usually react better to Ayurvedic treatment? Um, I assume you're asking about cancer care and not cancer side effects here, right? So you want to know what type of cancers, not, this is not a question on the side effects of cancer, it's just on cancer, what type of cancers respond. So Serena, would, you like to, would you like to clarify the question? Um, hi, Dr. Shiranjini. Uh, yes, actually, I'm thinking because obviously there are cancers that are a bit more aggressive or that, are, um, that don't uh, affect you systematically as quickly, right? So I'm just wondering, are there particular types of cancers which might actually respond um, better? So taking everything else as um, the same, so meaning you discover it at the same stage and you try and treat it with Ayurvedic treatment. So is there... Um, are there some that basically respond better? So um, if you think of cancers, uh, the categories of cancers, the ca cancers that affect the different tissues, right? Cancers that affect the nerve cells, like the glioblastomas, the astrocytomas, they are impossible to cure. Uh, whereas those like breast cancers, cervical cancers, if detected early, are better managed. So the same rule applies even for Ayurveda. What we say in Ayurveda is the seven tissue elements, right? Rasa, Rakta, Mamsa, Medha, and so on. Now, deeper the tissue, Rasa, Rakta are the most superficial tissues. Uh, Mamsa, Medha are the more deeper tissues. So deeper the tissue involvement, more the number of tissues that are involved, uh, they are not managed great. But lesser number of tissue involvement, lesser amount of tissue involvement, they do respond better. So most of our experience, uh, if you go by the, the um, distribution or the prevalence and incidence of cancers, breast cancers, cervical cancers, uh, colon cancers um, are slightly higher than the other categories of cancers. And these are the cancers that we normally see in our clinical practice also. So yes, I would say that we have more experience in handling these than the rarer ones. Prasanti is asking, doctor, from your experience, has there been cancer patients who do not respond well to CAM therapy, com complementary alternative med medicine therapy, and what could be possible reasons? Um, to be honest, in my experience, I've not come across someone who has not at all responded to CAM. So the, the degree to which they respond may be different. So 10%, 20%, to anywhere 80 to 90% of response to cancer side effects with CAM treatment. That is what we see. But even a small change is a huge change for them. So the smallest of small changes that we see um, does benefit. And it has never been the case that patients have not responded to CAM medicine for, I, for uh, cancer side effects. They have more often than not responded. But yes, if the disease has not been well arrested. If the cancer per se has not been well arrested, then their response to even the side effects does reduce considerably because the cancer is so, so strong that it is kind of negating all the effects of the therapies that we are trying. So that does happen, but it is very rare that, cancer, that patients do not at all respond to CAN therapies for side effects. Paritosh Bhatt is asking, Doctor, what is your opinion on co-relating cancer to Arbuda, to Sunny Pataja Vatarakta. Do you follow Vatarakta line of treatment for CA? Um, no, I do not follow uh, Vatarakta line of treatment. It's more the Arbuda management that we do follow for most of the uh, cancers that we see. But uh, for the side effects, um, depending on on which dosha we are seeing in predominance, which dhatu we are seeing being affected. Uh, we do the, uh, because there it is more of a chikitsa, which is uh, lakshanika in nature. So that is the line of treatment that we follow for the side effects. But for the management of cancers, yes, I do follow the Arbuda line. I have one question myself. I'm curious how 
fear plays a part because a lot of cancer patients have a lot of fear in them, whether they are going to recover, whether they will go worse, and there's fear of the pain. Do you see that if somebody is very fearful and worrying a lot, do they respond worse and vice versa? Yes, definitely. This is not just for cancers, but it is also for COVID. So <laughs> fear, uh, yes, fear does play a huge part in how your body, because fear stresses your body. Fear releases a lot of unwanted hormones within your body. Your cortisol levels go up, your ACTH levels go up, and all these, your inflammation goes up. So uh, any kind, that is why I said, uh, I talked about the psychological component, which is very, very important for better response. So you manage the disease, not just with, with medicines, but you also manage the disease by the way you approach the, the disease, by the way you uh, approach, uh, by the way you have confidence on, the, on, on your doctor, on your physician, on your healthcare practitioner. So there are a lot of things, the way your family responds to you, the way you uh, take it yourself. So multiple factors which influence the, the, the response to uh, treatments. So when one of this is out of place, nine other things do not work. So everything needs to go hand in hand for you to get a comprehensive, uh, which is why I said, uh, I did say that we do also, um, I, uh, in clinical practice, we also do give something for them to relieve their anxieties, relieve their depression, because the burden of the disease is not just on the physical body, it is also on the psych. So we do tell them to follow a um, uh, code of conduct, to have behavioral ethics that we talked about, to have positive thinking and so on. And that does help a lot on how they respond to the treatment. Thank you. Radha Tiwari is asking, different regions of India has different spices. Can and what spices, what spices can patients use? Also, which Sambara Padatha is the best? So there is no one, uh, one, uh, okay, there, there is no one spice that is the best, right? They, 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 it, it, is a, it doesn't work that way. So there are different spices uh, which are used um, across India. So there is turmeric, there is coriander, there is cinnamon, there is a whole lot of them that you can use in your daily cooking, cumin, uh, ajwain, uh, black cumin, there are so many that you can use in your daily um, uh, food um, as a spice and also as a herbal drink. You can make herbal trees, teas with these uh, spices. These herbal teas help to reduce the inflammation, the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines in your system. So they help to improve the inflammation and they reduce the inflammation. And so all herbs, uh, when used um, I mean, you, you should not overdo on this also. You cannot be adding pepper to your diet every day just because pepper is healthy, right? So uh, the right amount uh, of spices that are used um, will help. There is no one specific best herb that I would recommend. Thank you. Going back to an earlier question, asking about Vatarakta line of treatment. Um, Paritosh Bhatt is now asking because he says it says Sani Pataja Vatarakta is Abu Dakari. Yeah. And it's asking for clarification. Okay. So Sani Pataja stage of not just Vatarakta but many other diseases, as it progresses, it can end up in Arbuda. So it's not just uh, Vatarakta. So uh, the line of treatment would be on the primary disease that is um, causing it. And definitely after the disease is in its full blown state, when you've already seen uh, the cancerous state, you would to focus on Arbuda line of management. That is how I would look at it. Thank you. We're coming close to the end of the session. I'm gonna ask one last question. Now, in the last 18 months, you've begun to work with patients in Canada. Do you see any um, differences in how the patients respond, given their ethnicity, given that Ayurveda to them is totally different? 
Yeah, so um, Canada has a very diverse population with a whole lot of people from Asia mm -hmm. and East having come here, right? So most of the patients who do come for consultation, I would say about 70% of them are from this background, Asian and Middle Eastern. And 3% of them are from the Caucasian population. So uh, given that 70% of the patients are already from Asia and Middle East, they do have a very, um, they have an inherent knowledge about traditional medicine systems, and they do know quite a bit about uh, herbal medicines. And so it becomes that much more easier to interact with them and to um, to dispense uh, any herbs. The 30% of Caucasian population who come are also people who have studied Ayurveda. Uh, they would have um, a little bit of knowledge of herbal medicines and that is why they seek, they come and seek Ayurveda. So it's not been uh, a challenge in terms of uh, practicing Ayurveda here. Uh, we have a full-fledged setup uh, at the place where I work. Um, we do have a full-fledged therapy center with um, all therapies happening. So it's not been that much of an issue, um, but I would say some of the issues that do that I think not just in India, but all, I mean not just here, but in other countries outside India also would be some things like the healthcare. Uh, uh, healthcare here is government um, run, so we do not pay for our healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to alternative medicines, um, Ayurveda and the treatments and the prescriptions that we give in Ayurveda it is not supported by um, the healthcare. It is an out-of-pocket expense. Uh, so that those are things that um, are different um, uh, in, in India or in some countries. Um, even insurance does provide um, coverage for uh, Ayurveda prescriptions, but uh, here it is not yet the norm. So that, those kind of uh, issues are there, but generally people are very well accepting and it's not been a challenge to practice. Thank you, Dr. Sri Ranjini. We've come to the end of a wonderful, lovely sharing session from her. And if you'd like to share this with your friends, if you think it's really helpful, this is on Facebook Live. Please share the link with friends and family. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Good rest of the Thank day. Thank you, Doctor. 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 Thank you, Doctor.